like to welcome you all to uh, the first uh, event organized by the Tocqueville Lecture Series uh, this semester. My name is Aurelian Kriyutsu, and I direct the Tocqueville program. Um, uh, it's um, um, only appropriate that we start this year in the Tocqueville room, or we are presently with the round table on uh, Tocqueville's work. And we have the great privilege and pleasure to have with us uh, a round table on a book that is written by arguably the leading Tocqueville scholar uh, in the United States, right now, James Schleifer. And uh, we have uh, two other panelists who uh, agreed to um, be with us. I'm going to introduce the topic uh, briefly, introduce the panelists, and then open up for discussion. Um, there is perhaps no other um, thinker um, that retains more relevance for us today than Tocqueville's work. Democracy in America has been quoted uh, numerous times by our presidents, by politicians, public officials, but also, uh, in many ways, Tocqueville has proved to be a better um, interpreter of the tendencies within democracy uh, than many other thinkers, uh, more so than Marx, more so than John Stuart Mill, more so than Adam Smith. The complexity of Tocqueville's work has uh, puzzled its interpreters, his interpreters over the time. Tocqueville has the distinguished uh, quality of being liked by both people on the left and on the right for different reasons. Not many people can claim that uh, um, quality. And Tocqueville's works uh, especially have retained an enduring relevance for uh, other parts of the world, not only the western part of the world to which his analysis were related, but also to the non-western part of the world. Democracy spreading in Asia, democracy spreading in Latin America, and so. So I've chosen the panel today with, with these considerations in mind. Um, I have invited uh, Dr. Christine Henderson from Liberty Fund to join us because Christine is, uh, among other things, the editor of Tocqueville's Voyages, The Evolution of His Ideas and Their Journey Beyond His Times, published by Liberty Fund in 2014, that extends the voyages of Tocqueville, mental voyages, into non-Western um, uh, context. And I've also asked one of our uh, very own graduate students, Kwang Yu Zhao from Political Science, to join us with a view of applying or thinking about how to apply Tocqueville's ideas into a non-Western context, that would be the, the China one. Um, so that is the rationale behind the, the panel today. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists briefly and then open up for discussion for, for the consideration of the book. Uh, Jim um, Schleifer received his PhD in history from Yale University, where he studied with George Wilson Pearson, the renowned Tocqueville scholar, um, who uh, was instrumental in creating the Beinecke Library um, Tocqueville uh, section at the Beinecke Library at Yale. Jim has taught as visiting professor at Yale University and the University of Paris, and was um, the dean of the library at the College of New Rochelle in New Rochelle uh, uh, for a long time. He also studied, uh, he also taught at universities in Tokyo, Shanghai, and Beijing. He's the author of the celebrated The Making of Democracy in America, with two editions, the most recent one published by Liberty Fund in 2000. And the subject of today's roundtable is, is Jim's latest book. A flyer is on the table for you with a 30% discount. <laughs> Tocqueville, uh, published by Polity Press. Uh, and we will be uh, talking about the main themes of the book in our uh, discussion today. Christine Henderson is a senior fellow at the Liberty Fund. She is a political theorist and a friend of mine. Um, her work focuses <laughs> upon the French <laughs> liberal tradition. And she worked with Jim Schleifer and Eduardo Nola, the author of the critical edition, on uh, putting out the uh, terrific critical edition of Democracy in America, which appeared in four volumes, bilingual edition, French on the, set, on the left, uh, uh, properly, so English on the right, <laughs> uh, in 2010. There is also a two-volume English edition of that work. Uh, Quang Guizhao, as I said, is a graduate student in our department. Uh, his main research interests are on Tocqueville and modern French political thought, or broadly defined modern political thought. Uh, with all of this in mind, uh, I'd like to um, join me, uh, ask you to join me in uh, welcoming our guest to the Thank you. Jim, uh, I want to uh, welcome all of you, and uh, special thanks to uh, the workshop, uh, to Alison Sturgeon, who made all the arrangements, and uh, of course for the invitation originally from uh, Aurelia. Um, it's a great great pleasure to be here. I think it's the second time I've been here at the workshop, and uh, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful place. 
uh, Aurelian asked me to be brief and informal and to talk about uh, my new book and also talk a little bit, uh, even more briefly, about the translation of uh, Tokyo's Democracy, the critical edition. And <coughs> I'm going to do that and uh, try to keep myself brief, uh, which can sometimes be a problem, but I will try. Um, I also, if I have time, will add a few more personal comments about my work as a Tokyo scholar, my uh, lifelong work as a Tokyo scholar. But uh, first of all, some uh, comments about my recent book. Um, I was asked by uh, Polity Press in uh, Cambridge, England to write the book. They have a classic thinker series, and they wanted to have a volume on Tocqueville. So they uh, contacted me and asked me to do it, and the key thing they wanted, of course, was a study of Tocqueville as a political and social theorist beyond just democracy in America. And uh, almost all of my work has been focused on democracy in America, the making of democracy in America, translating it. Most of the articles, other books I've written, are focused on democracy in America. So this was a, a, a chance for me to, to sort of break out of that and look at Tocqueville uh, more broadly. And so um, after a few days of uh, weighing whether to do it or not, I decided to go ahead. The other attraction for me was that um, they were perfectly happy to, be, to let me use my own translation of Democracy in America, the Liberty Fund translation. When I did the Chicago Companion to Tocqueville's Democracy in America, they insisted that I use the Mansfield translation, uh, which I did, um, and worked my way around it. But in any case, um, that was a condition for them. So <clears throat> I was able to use my own translation, and then I used the Chicago translation of the Ancien Regime, the Old Regime, that was done by Alan Kahan. So that, those were the two main things. And, and other things were using other people's translations of correspondence and so on. And if they weren't translated, then I translated them myself. So a little bit of extra translation work. Uh, what's different about this book? Um, uh, the first thing, as I've already said, it's a, it's a much broader um, approach to Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville beyond democracy in America, Tocqueville beyond 1840. When I did the Chicago Companion, I in fact included a chapter of Tocqueville after democracy in America, and again, uh, Chicago did not want that. They told me, no, drop that, so I did. Uh, this gave me the chance to move beyond it and to look at Tocqueville um, in democracy in America, in the Ancien Regime, and in a lot of his other writings. Um, so it's um, uh, as I say, much more inclusive, and emphasizes particularly the uh, post-1840 parts of his, of, of his writing and his thinking. Um, in the course of doing that, of course, the, the book, I also went back to the old regime, to the Ancien Regime, and considered that in ways I had not done in a long time. And, and a thread throughout the new book, Tocqueville, a thread throughout that is um, a list of various ways to read the Ancien Regime. And I think that's uh, also a contribution and it's something different about this book. The other key thing that I did in this book was to try to re-emphasize an interpretation of Tocqueville which emerged in the United States in the 1960s and then was kind of lost. Uh, and that is to, to look at Tocqueville's economic ideas and his social reform ideas and proposals. Um, Primarily in the last few decades, Tocqueville has been understood mostly as a political philosopher, a political theorist, and some people have said he didn't really pay any attention to economics, he wasn't interested in that at all. Um, but in the 1960s, um, with the pioneering work by uh, Seymour Drescher on social, Tocqueville's ideas and Beaumont's ideas on social reform, there was the emergence of recognition that he did look at economic questions and he was interested in the issue of poverty. He was interested in the issue of, of trying to, to forward uh, economic and social equality. Uh, he, he was uh, interested in, in, in uh, various kinds of social reform. Um, and um, that approach was carried forward by uh, Roger Boucher in some of his writing. Um, and it has continued to be um, stronger, I think, in Europe with um, some of the writings by Francoise Melonio and uh, Kezlassi and uh, Jean-Louis Benoit and some others. And then more recently, um, writings by Michael Drolet in England and um, the book by Swedberg in the United States about Tokyo's economic ideas. So there, 
I was trying to take it, take in that newer uh, scholarship, and 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 go back a bit, look again at that aspect of Tokyo, which I think has been effaced a little bit in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, the other thing that I was trying to do in this book was to look at Tocqueville uh, not only as a thinker but as a man of action, as I said. He did have an important political career uh, from um, uh, 1839 until his resignations uh, from all of his posts in 1852. Uh, and uh, it was not an inconsequential inconse political career. Uh, he um, had some important uh, roles, very important roles. <coughs> so, um, I was also trying to look at Tocqueville as a man of letters and Tocqueville as a political figure. Um, I was working with certain basic assumptions, um, and uh, these I may, if I get to talk a little bit about some personal comments, I may very well come back to these. But one of the things which I have consistently underscored in all of the work that I've done, books and various chapters I've contributed to edited volumes, one of the things I've done is to insist on the unity of Tocqueville's thought. Um, I have made a big point of saying that the 1835 and 1840 volumes are, of the democracy are not two separate books. They're the same book with different emphases, obviously. Uh, and I also, in this book, argue that uh, even the Ancien Régime, 1856, can be seen as a third volume of the same thing. Uh, now, that's something of an exaggeration. Obviously, they're very important changes, and I try to point those out as well. And I think one of the interesting things about doing this book for me is to underscore the unity, the essential unity of Tocqueville's purposes, his principles, the kinds of things he notices about democracy, the possible solutions that he suggests, to underscore the unity of that and also look at significant changes that did take place his new emphasis on the new democratic despotism, for example, his uh, awareness, increasing awareness and fear about socialism in France, and so on. There are others that you could point to. So there's a kind of balancing act to show the dynamism of Tocqueville's thought, um, and, and that, that's one of the basic assumptions that I have in this book. I also was looking again at some of his basic concepts. Um, runs closely parallel to what I tried to do in the Chicago Companion, uh, but um, not, not restricting myself to democracy in America. So, um, for example, on the concept of liberty, uh, Tocqueville's um, highest value, if you want, uh, I tried to underscore that um, liberty was not just an abstraction with Tocqueville. It had to do with, with very specific liberties, uh, and he talked especially about the practice of liberty, the doing of liberty. Um, if you if you don't if you're not engaged, then liberty is empty. And so I, I tried to look at, at liberty through that lens. Um, I looked again at the uh, value, the importance of equality as one of his basic concepts, and underscored again the fact that Tocqueville's assumption about democracy was that it assumed a certain basic equality, um, and that extreme inequalities were incompatible with healthy democracy. And so equality um, for Tocqueville includes the, the concern about extreme and fixed inequalities in any society. So uh, that, of course, connects to the whole question of social reform and how you avoid extreme poverty and extreme inequality. Um, I looked again at the concept of democracy, which is one of the slipperiest um, concepts of Tocqueville, what, what he means by democracy. Um, he tries to define it many times. Uh, but I underscored what I think to me is, is a key part of his understanding of democracy, and that is real democracy is participatory democracy. Democracy without people participating, uh, without um, people being engaged, is, 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 is not real, it's, it's hollow. Uh, the, same, it's the same thing, it's connected with, with the idea of hollow liberty or sham liberty. If people aren't doing liberty, if they're not practicing liberty, if they're not participating in democracy, then it's all just a sham. Uh, and then the other concept, of course, that I touch on particularly in this book is the idea of revolution and the spirit of revolution. And Tocqueville says some 
the wonderful things, the very interesting things about revolution and democracy and the spirit of revolution. Uh, and he's very concerned about the way in which the spirit of revolution, a kind of corrosive revolutionary enthusiasm, is so discoloring and wounding to democratic society. Uh, so um, I, I tried to, to point that out as well. Uh, as I said, the other key, uh, one of the other key things that I tried to do in this book is to look at Tocqueville's economic ideas and his social reform ideas, and uh, I um, devoted a chapter to that. And I, I, without going into a lot of the details of it, because I don't have time to do it, um, what I tried to point out is he, he wasn't suggesting or envisioning certain social reform proposals simply for conservative purposes. Uh, that wasn't the only reason why he was interested in reform. He wasn't trying to ward off revolution or ward off um, changes that he didn't want to accept, like the attacks on private property. It wasn't just that purpose. He, he also was interested in social reform because of what he witnessed with uh, the problem of poverty. Extreme inequalities, grinding poverty, destroy the human spirit under, undermine human potential as far as Tocqueville was concerned. So Tocqueville's moral sensitivities, I think, are very important. He realized that um, you needed to do certain kinds of reforms. You needed to try to attenuate some of the worst aspects of poverty and inequality in order to allow people to flourish. Uh, as their minds, their bodies, as he, he talks about the importance of more equitable sharing of the good things of life. And he didn't mean just material things. So uh, he's talking about the, the, the mental and spiritual and intellectual pleasures of life. Um, all of this led me to some other um, themes in the book. Um, one is to mention, uh, to underscore, that Tocqueville recognized the need for government. Sometimes people forget that. He, he had various things in mind about shaping institutions, moder moderating and uplifting and educating the, the democracy. He had certain ideas about social reform, and for that you need government. And so uh, he says very specifically in various places that you, you, you can't have an indolent government. Government has to have a role. For Tocqueville, the question is, what's the role? What are the limits of the role? Yes, government, but not too much government. Um, this is a key question for Tocqueville. I've already mentioned um, underscoring the moral dimension of Tocqueville's thought. I think this is very important, um, and I've already I've already said it. Uh, it. It connects to his sense of what we would call perhaps distributive justice. Um, that um, uh, the, the moral, the moral um, importance of, of greater justice in the world. In the course of doing this book, of course, I came again uh, to try to illustrate various uh, examples, the key traits of Tokyo's thinking and writing. Uh, you can't talk about his ideas and his effort to express himself without getting into distinctive characteristics of his writing, his language, his awareness of his audience. Um, I talked about these things in the Chicago Companion to Tocqueville's Democracy, but it, it comes again when you look at all of his writings. Uh, he, he, his essential stance was one of moderation. He hated extremes. He avoided absolutes. He was constantly reconsidering, reconsidering, rethinking, rewriting the translation has many, many examples of his, of his revisions, or his redraftings. The other key thing that I uh, talk about in this book at the end uh, is, it, it's, it's assumed to the whole book, but I at the end have the chapter on his continuing relevance, uh, the sort of resonance between Tocqueville and other thinkers in the 19th and 20th and into the 21st century. 
And I mentioned what uh, Relian has already talked about, Professor Kriyut has already talked about, the broadening international appreciation of Tokyo, which is quite remarkable in the last few decades. I'm going to uh, jump now to uh, just uh, a few words about the translation, um, which Aurelian also mentioned, uh, told me to touch on. Um, again, um, this is something I was asked to do. I had already done the making um, and of Tokyo's Democracy, which involved uh, translating a lot of uh, Tokyo's manuscripts that are at the Banaki Library at, at Yale. Most of his manuscripts relating to the United States, to democracy in America, are at the Beinecke Library at Yale. And as a graduate student, George Pearson introduced me to them. So there I was. And um, so um, the people at uh, the Liberty Fund um, uh, and uh, Eduardo Noya, who did the critical edition, he was the editor, asked me to, to translate it. Uh, they asked me a couple of times. I kept saying no. But then finally, I decided I would do it. Um, and um, I worked then very closely with the Liberty Fund and with the editorial committee that the Liberty Fund set up. Uh, Christine uh, uh, was, on, uh, was on that committee. Um, my, my wife was on the committee as a sort of initial reader. Was um, that the chair of the committee? <laughs> was it Christine or, or No, the chair, the chair of the committee originally was David Bovenizer, and then I think you knew. Oh, were you the yeah. chair? <laughs> <laughs> it was a Quiet leader. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no. But um, the, um, the the primary reader was Paul Seaton. Uh, Pierre Manon was on the committee. Eduardo was on the committee. Peter Waller was on the committee. Um, Catherine, Zucker. Catherine Zucker was on the committee. And what we did, we met a couple of times a year. I did translations when I felt they were acceptable to me. I gave them to my wife, who's bilingual, uh, and she looked at them uh, and um, suggested anything that she thought might be improved. And one of the things we did in the course, at, this was a 10-year project, uh, and the with all of the material that was, all of the manuscript material that's part of the critical edition, it doubled the size of Tocqueville's book. So uh, it, it was a major project, and what my wife and I did uh, and I'll get to this in a moment in terms of the principles of translation, we read it aloud to each other uh, to make sure that it read well. Uh, so we did that. And then Eduardo um, and Paul Seaton, who is the primary reader, read everything. Uh, and everyone else was sent batches for a various editorial committee meetings that we had. And they read certain batches. And then we all got together and talked about what we saw. And so there were revisions, and revisions, and more revisions, <laughs> and uh, things that I revi revised at the very end. And then mistakes we found uh, later on that we uh, had to revise. <laughs> um, no matter what you do, certain mistakes creep through. But anyway, uh, it was, it was a, a very important project for the Liberty Fund. And for me, and this is, I've said this before, um, for me it was very important because it forced me to get back into the manuscripts, Tocqueville's manuscripts, in a very detailed way, to consider them in a very detailed way, so that because of the Liberty Fund and the Liberty Fund project of the translation of the critical edition, everything I've done since then is because of that. The Chicago Companion, the Polity Tocqueville book, it, it's all because of that 10-year immersion uh, into insanity, <laughs> uh, Tokyo insanity. I told my wife the other day it's sort of like a crazy and since I was a graduate. Anyway, the 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 principles of translation. Just to talk about that for a moment, uh, the Liberty Fund has had certain standards that they wanted. They they didn't haven't done really. I don't think they've done very many translations, if any, before that. But they had certain principles in mind. One was obviously something accurate and close something faithful to the original, something readable and straightforward. Uh, and uh, I, so what I was trying to do was to put Tokyo into contemporary American English, um, to make it smooth, readable, accessible, clear. Uh, and I, I think we succeeded in doing that, the, 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 all of us uh, together. Um, I, we did 
certain specific things, like following Tocqueville's paragraphing, which is kind of strange in some cases, but we did follow it. Um, we tried to, I tried to show in the translation the variety of sentence structure in Tocqueville. I couldn't do it all the time. I mean, I couldn't, you couldn't follow his sentences exactly because sometimes his sentences were far too complex and too long to work in English. So you broke, I broke them up. But it was very important to show some very long sentences with lots of sub clauses and whatever, and yet some very specific and pointed sentences. So we, we tried to maintain that kind of flavor. Um, why do another translation was another question people have asked. Uh, because there have been other modern translations, recent translations, at least recent in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, what's different about this one? The key thing that's different about it, uh, first of all, I would argue, I'm the translator, so you have to forgive me, but I would argue that it's the most readable of the translations. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy to carry around, <laughs> but it is, the most, it is the most readable, I think. Um, but that's not the main point. The main point is that it is the critical edition. There's a critical edition in French, published by Gallimard, in the Playad edition. I was one of the co-editors for that. Uh, that was published just after the French publication of Eduardo Noya's critical edition. He also translated that into Spanish. So there's a Spanish critical edition and uh, the Noya French, and, and what they were asking me to do was translate the Noya French critical edition into, into English, and, which is what we did. And as I said, the key thing is it shows successive drafts it shows other papers, outlines, Tokyo's marginalia, all sorts of things. So that if you look at the critical edition, you'll see that there are some pages where the text is just the top few lines and the rest is all manuscript. Um, so it's, it's that richness of all of the other manuscripts, variants, drafts, outlines, and all the other stuff that I, I talked about. Um, and um, I, so, so that's really the, I think the the key value, um, and it was, it was also one of the most challenging things because if you're trying to show the changes that someone made over two or three versions, you have to maintain a consistency of language, but then show what he's changing. So it's um, it, it's a particular challenge uh, for for a translator. Um, I think I'll I think I'll stop there for that discussion about the translation, and simply say that um, now it has become I, I think it's fair to say that all or almost all uh, really serious Tokyo scholars use the critical edition uh, if they're working in English. I mean it isn't that they're not using the other translations as well, but I think uh, serious Tokyo scholars working in English now use the critical edition if they can do it in French, of course, they can use the original French, uh, but um, it, it, it's a translation, I think, a critical edition, uh, which um, ha has really gained um, acceptance by scholars. I want to make a couple of very brief uh, personal comments, move beyond the, uh, the book. Uh, one is that, as I already said, um, from the time I was a graduate student, I arrived at Yale, and after a year, um, I uh, got introduced to the Tocqueville papers that were there. And since then, um, that's been what I do. <laughs> um, I, I have never approached Tocqueville's book as the text. Uh, it's always been with all of the variants, with all of the drafts, with all of the manuscripts, with the critical comments of his father and his brothers and, and Tocqueville's marginal comments and so my whole approach has been with all of those papers, and that's been true uh, for 50 years. And so I said it's a kind of insanity, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. Um, the other uh, couple of comments I would make, I have always, and be, because um, George Wilson Pearson introduced me to Tocqueville, um, I've always been a staunch advocate of the importance of the American journey. Some Tocqueville scholars have tended to downplay that a bit, 
uh, Tokyo came and he already had all his ideas in mind. He didn't really need to come to America. It was just an excuse. Um, that kind of approach. Um, nobody says that quite as extremely as that, but that's sort of the implication. And I've always resisted that. And I've written several um, chapters in various books pointing out how important the American journey was and what Tokyo learned there. Um, as I said, I also have consistently argued for the unity of Tokyo's thought. Um, and the other point I would say, obviously, uh, sort of an obvious point, it, the importance of Tokyo as a political and social theorist. Uh, for all of the reasons that Aurelian um, summarized before, his complexity, his originality, his relevance uh, even today. The other thing that I will say, and then I'm finished concluding, um, is the importance of, um, among Tokyo scholars, and I think it's true uh, for scholars who study other important figures and other periods and whatever other topics, um, it's very important for, uh, the, for generations to welcome each other. When I was starting as a graduate student, just beginning, Cy Drescher, who's not too much older than I am, but he had already written a book. He was already sort of launched. And Doris Goldstein, same thing. She had already written a book, and she was launched. Um, and when they found out I was working on Tokyo, they were incredibly welcoming to me and encouraging and how important Tokyo was and welcoming me into the group of Tokyo scholars. And uh, that was very important to me. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a key thing to try to continue to do that. And I know that Aurelian is, is doing it. And uh, I'm trying. I'm trying. So, so, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that's a, a personal thing which, which, which is extremely important to me, to try to encourage uh, younger scholars to um, take up the Tokyo banner and be as crazy <laughs> uh, as I am. Yeah. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, George. Christine. But it's a good kind of craziness. <laughs> it's the best kind of craziness. Um, thanks, Aurelian. I'm delighted to be part of this panel that is honoring uh, Jim Schlecht, not only his latest book, but also um, his career in social scholarship and, and his place really at the top, as Aurelian said, of the Tocquevillian world. It's one of the, the leading uh, scholars, not just in the English speaking world, but in the world. Period. Uh, Jim and I first met in September of 2001 when I uh, took over the leadership of the editorial committee that was overseeing and serving as the consulting body for um, Jim's really masterful translation of Eduardo Nola's historical critical edition of Democracy in America. Um, that's the book that's passing around, but that's just part of it. The, that's one of the two volumes in English, and the, obviously the bilingual goes to four in French English. So that's half of it. And what it is, Jim's already described it a little bit, but the whole, I mean, it more than doubles it. The, the text of it, I think, is over 1,300 pages, um, not including the 100-plus page intro, not including the, I don't know, 50-page biblio or something yeah. that goes with it. And, and it's a kind of amplified version of the text. As Jim said, it works through and it includes um, drafts, variants, correspondence, working notebooks, notebooks, outlines, um, comments from the friends and family he has to read the, the draft as it was moving along. And it, it in some places, Jim uh, mentioned how it reincorporates them into the, the footnotes in some places. But in other places, you see excised portions reintegrated into the main text. So sort of marked out in certain ways so the reader knows whether he or she is reading standard text or reading something that was later crossed out. Um, if you're interested not just in total thought but also in his sort of creative process, his intellectual process, it's, it's a marvelous resource. And it is, um, I'll just say it's marvelously translated, but I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Of course, I knew of Jim long before I met him. His 1980, The Making of Tocqueville's Democracy in America, is truly one of the classic studies um, of democracy in America. In that book, Jane, uh, Jim sort of reconstructs Tocqueville's voyage to America, but also his second voyage, his return to America during the process of, of writing and, and composing Democracy in America. 
Um, via this reconstruction we see in that book, which is down there in the corner, um, we see, Jim lets us see some of Tocqueville's mental habits and patterns. Um, he talks, for example, about Tocqueville's habit of working in oppositional pairs in order to refine his analysis and his judgments. Um, in addition to Tocqueville's intellectual and compositional process, the book talks about the distinctive character of the American environment for Tocqueville, American institutions, the relationship between centralization and democracy, all sort of familiar Tocquevillian themes, but treated in a really specific way. Tyranny of the majority, democratic despotism, egoism and individualism, and, and then the variety of ways, and this is an important thing that Jim um, has spoken about many times, the variety of ways in which Tocqueville understands the idea of democracy. Um, and he, we might induce him to say more about that later. The book, like all of Jim's works, is um, an exceptionally fine example of what is known as the Yale School of Tocqueville Scholarship, which means that its depth and its nuance comes from exactly what you heard Jim testimony, you know, Jim talk about right now, which is its deep engagement with all of those papers, with the drafts, the correspondence, the notes, the notebooks, all of these things that are housed in Yale's manuscript collection, the Tocqueville manuscript collection. Um, one reviewer of the making of Tocqueville's Democracy in America observed the Yale manuscript collection built up by George Wilson Pearson has found in Schleifer a scholar equal to the task. <laughs> um, yeah, Jim's a uh, deep familiarity with that collection. I guess, honestly, you must you know that collection better than anyone in the world. It's my guess. And I. You and Eduardo. Yeah, yeah. You've been there more recently. I'm going to go for yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, more. Yeah. He, he knows it, I think, better than anyone, including the librarian, no doubt about that. Um, it, it made him the best choice for us to um, translate that, that edition of Democracy in America. Um, we really felt, and we continue to feel, extraordinarily lucky that after however many goes, we convinced him to embark on a decade-long sort of crazy journey. Um, so, uh, you know, the edition, as, as we've said, is a really complicated thing. It's not just, it's complicated in a way that, that I've described the bits and pieces that go into it, but also it's, it's sort of crazily constructed when you look at it to, to integrate those in ways that make us as readers understand that we're invariants. There are things that are square bracketed. There are things that are embraces. There are things that are in regular parentheses. There are things that are italicized. And so it's very easy to get lost if you, you know, to sort of you find yourself referring back to the beginning to find out if it was excised one way. What do these markings mean? What do these markings mean? And so because Jim knew all of the pieces that went into doing this, um, I think it made him sort of best able to navigate it. So even uh, Jim confessed from time to time that he would find himself, you know, sort of translating along and think, I don't remember that part. How have I missed this line? Only to realize, you know, sort of when he got to the end, oh God, that was a fragment or a draft thing that started two pages before in the translation that had sort of fallen off my radar as being something bracketed from the standard text. Um, as one of the world's leading scholars of Tocqueville, Jim was also, as a translator, more than well equipped to really make those judgments about which English words best or better captured um, Tocqueville's meaning. As Jim pointed out already, and I'll underline it, you had help in the process. Um, Allison, uh, his wife in the first stages, Paul Seaton, Mel Richter as yeah. primary readers, um, the editorial committee meeting, his editorial committee whose uh, members he's already described, and then in the final stages, though not with the translation itself, we had some help from our host today, Aurelian. Um, our editorial committee meetings were generally orderly discussions about how to improve Jim's text and how to meet those twin demands of fidelity and readability. Um, at times, though, the meetings would sort of be punctuated by hilarity when all of us would have been sort of wrangling with, oh no, there was something Jim didn't like, and we would say, yeah, yeah, we don't like that either. We go, what about X? What about we? Y? What about Z? And suddenly the group would go, yeah, yeah, Z, 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 and we all go, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great. And we'd go to read it back, and we'd realize that it wasn't English, that we had found some perfect franglais combination that made sense to everybody sitting around the room, but that would have made no sense to a reader. 
Um, in other moments, there was poor Jim sort of pleading with us for moderation when the same process would happen and we would all seize on some change that made us happy and Jim's, Jim would be saying, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it, don't, we're not settling on that, pleading with us to say, you know, look, yes, that might work here, but what about the other 1,293 pages that have preceded this one change? Or if we change this, what trails with us? And in those moments, I realized that, Jane, that Jim, um, in addition to being a fine Tocqueville scholar and exceptional translator, that he had the patience of the saints. <laughs> Unfortunately, at the end of those days, there were martinis, and many of them in some cases. Um, the result of this decade-plus endeavor is, in my view, also um, actually the finest translation of democracy in America to date. And in that, I'm in saying that I actually don't mean the NOLA edition itself, all of the things that make that critical edition different. Um, I'm a massive fan of the translation as well, but I mean simply the work in bringing Tocqueville's French to English. Um, it is to Jim that we are the clearest, the most readable, and I think the most faithful translation in democracy in America for people who want to doubt translation choices, and they're always imperfect in the, the bilingual. They can always flip to the left side and check it out in the French. Um, but honestly, I think it's, it's really hard to improve upon the choices that you made. Um, my only regret in this whole edition is when we did, I don't remember what year this came out, we did the big four volume in 2010, and we did this one, do you know when this one came out? 20, a year later or something. A couple years later, um, somewhere that I can't see, 2012. And my only regret was that when we chose to do this, that we didn't instead do an English only that would have been a standard text only, that would have just been your translation of the canonical text. Um, because had we done that, I think that without doubt, in one volume, it would be the standard text. Just as you're right, yeah, I think that. that. You can still do that. Right? <laughs> I'm still trying, Jim. I'm still trying. <laughs> I am trying. Um, anyway, yeah, I think that that would be, it is the best translation, I think, in around, period. Um, through Jim's translation and through its precision, in words choice through Jim's own understanding of how the various parts of Tocqueville fit together and um, Jim's success in allowing the reader to see how those parts fit together. The reader is able to learn a lot about Tocqueville. Through the process of translating, however, as Jim's just mentioned, um, he learned some things, too. And, and not just to smile and hope that some of the various editorial committee's enthusiasms would sort of pass into the night. Um, the process of translation was, for Jim, as he's already mentioned, an opportunity to discover some things in Tocqueville that he hadn't um, quite had a chance to notice or to see in the same way. Um, those discoveries have fueled some of his recent work, his post-translation work. He has um, a couple of pieces, as he mentioned quickly, um, refuting the claim that Tocqueville came to America already knowing what he was going to find that he had the whole thing in his head and the, the journey was just a pretext and you know, he could have just written it, stayed home and written it in France. Um, and he's shown us, I think, convincingly uh, by going through the, the text itself and by talking about the places where Tocqueville comments upon being struck by something or discovering something that was unexpected to him in America. Or, I didn't expect to see this. This was new to me. By going through all of those places that Tocqueville mentions in the text itself to to show that Tocqueville himself was discovering things. Um, and it turns out that many of the things that Tocqueville discovered um, intersect with key themes that we know about in democracy in America. And hopefully Jim will be uh, convinced to say a few more words about that side of, of the newness of Tocqueville of, um, in the question and answer that'll follow that. With the two later books, the Chicago companion and then the most recent Tocqueville, um, Jim has returned to considering Tocqueville's thought more broadly, um, first with the Chicago Companion, which as he said is keyed to the Mansfield Winthrop Chicago edition of Democracy in America. But there Jim really lucidly lays out has small chapters on all of the key themes on of democracy in America um, and discussions of those themes. That's a great resource, um, not just for people who are first dipping their little pinky toes into democracy in America, but also 
if you are sort of trying to refresh yourself on those, it's also wonderful because it cites the key sort of passages, and it'll say, you know, key passages to read about for equality of conditions or X, Y, Z, or for democratic justiceism. And so that's a kind of useful shorthand if you don't want to lug around the two or four volume edition of this translation. Um, the most recent book uh, about which you heard some, and I think we're going to hear some more in a, a little bit, uh, as Jim said, also goes and moves beyond democracy in America, looking at Tocqueville's thought more broadly. Um, like Jim, I'm in the camp of Tocqueville's thought as a whole, broadly speaking, but that of course there are particular differences between the ideas in the Ancien Regime and in democracy in America, because he's talking about different contexts, but I don't think there are fundamental shifts in his thought, and this new book helps us to see that, um, moving beyond into, actually I, I was thinking about the economics chapter myself, into areas that Jim hasn't traditionally worked on. Um, and it's the same thing, it, the, the expertise with the notes and with the drafts and with all of the variants and the whole manuscript collection, and his entire career of immersion in that collection. Um, I think lets Jim do those things with a kind of depth to it that's surprising for, for a slim book. You know, often slim volume is code for slim volume that sort of superficially treats all of these things, but that's absolutely not the case in this. Instead, it's a kind of distillation of decades of up close work into something that's that's um, that is smaller, but that that doesn't sacrifice depth for being able to give us an overview of it. Um, I, I want to end by mentioning another um, thread that has run through much of Jim's work, and, and he touched on it also today. Um, it's the relevance of, of Tocqueville to us today. Um, I recently came across a New York Times piece that Jim had written in 1981, I think on July 4th, 1981, <laughs> it was published on the 4th of July, in which he observed that Tocqueville continues to speak for no single party or viewpoint, and therefore has something valuable to say to all. In other places in his work, Jim has commented more extensively upon the various ways in which Tocqueville resonates with liberals, conservatives, libertarians, communitarians. Um, in the, the Tocqueville Chicago book, he does that. In the book we're honoring today, he ends with a chapter on Tocqueville's relevance, including resonances of Tocqueville's work in thinkers like Mill, Weber, Arendt, Hayek, Piketty. Um, I don't remember who else is in that, that group. But if part of Jim's legacy is to have enriched total scholarship with, this, with the rich archival resources of which he is the master, another part of his legacy will surely have been to remind us of how forward-looking Tocqueville is and how relevant the 19th century Frenchman remains to our time. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Kwon Gyu. Great talk. And thank you. Thanks for... Professor Schleifer's excellent lecture about his new book and Dr. Anderson's uh, sharing of the story behind the editing of the, the critical edition of the uh, Democracy in America. And uh, as a PhD student here studying political theory and uh, who is especially passionate about Tokyo, I'm happy and honored to join this discussion. And also as a student from China, I think my experience of uh, knowing and studying Tokyo we also partly show the contemporary relevance of Tokyo to, to, the, to the world, which I will talk about later. But uh, first, I want to share my share with you my knowledge about Professor Schleifer's uh, special contribution to the Tokyo scholarship, which is also uh, reflected in this new book. Uh, in an interview by another Tokyo scholar, Matthew Mancini, Professor Schleifer mentioned the fateful moment when he studied at Yale in 1960s. Professor George Wilson Pearson took him to an underground uh, book vault in Yale's Benick Library and showed him a, a few big boxes which contained the, the copies of Tokyo's manuscripts. I think for, for us, they are quite illegible uh, and other materials. Pearson uh, assigned to Slifer the, the task of studying these materials and said, if you are going to do it, you must do it well. So as we know, this task, uh, task end, ended up as Professor Schleif's lifelong career in studying uh, Tokyo and especially democracy in America. Uh, these materials uh, 
I mostly talk with unpublished uh, manuscripts, uh, private correspondence, and uh, drafts related to his trip in America and uh, related to the, the book uh, Democracy in America. Um, these uh, uh, original copies uh, remain in Tocqueville's own uh, private library in his own uh, chateau in Normandy. And these materials are very important because they reveal Tocqueville's many real, frank, uh, and of course sometimes unpolished uh, impressions and thoughts about American society, which, was, uh, which were quite uh, unknown uh, previous, previously uh, based on his published text. And uh, they... Uh, they also reveal the, uh, the sources of Tocqueville's thinking, as Professor Strives introduced, like which, which books he read, uh, which interesting and important figures and uh, in, uh, incidents he, he and Vermont uh, encountered in America. Uh, as, a, as a very brief uh, parenthesis, I want to mention that this, this work of bringing those manuscripts to America, to Yale, was actually started by, by uh, Indiana Hoosier, uh, Paul Lambert White, who, attend, who was born and uh, grew up in Indiana and uh, actually attended Indiana University from 1910 to 1913. Uh, uh, long story short, he later became, he became uh, instructor in Yale, Yale's history department. It was White who first found these materials in Tocqueville's shadow and br brought them to the world. And, uh, uh, but unfortunately, his premature death prevented him from finishing a job and producing, producing more research works. But fortunately, uh, pr uh, Professor Schleif's mentor, uh, Pearson, uh, continued the, the collection and study of these materials when he did his dissertation at Yale in 19, uh, 1920s, 30s. Uh, Pearson published his ground, groundbreaking work, uh, Tokyo and Bermuda America, in 1938, which recovered almost I would say almost every day activity of Tocqueville's stay uh, in America. As a historical uh, work, I would say it also grasped uh, incisively Tocqueville's major theoretical uh, topic and thoughts. Adding this new material to the academic, this book revived, or more accurately speaking, continued Americans' uh, passion, enormous interest and passions on Tocqueville in the 20th century. So partly based on the Yale collection, uh, Professor Schleif published the milestone book, The, uh, the Making of Tocqueville's Democracy in America in 1981, uh, developed from his dissertation. Uh, Pearson regarded, regarded Schleif as his successor, while Pearson's work focused on Tocqueville's real, first real physical trip to America. Uh, Schleif's book recovered the so-called Tocqueville's second voyage to America, namely uh, the process of how Tocqueville uh, prepared and wrote the two volumes of Democracy in America after he returned from the U.S. So this excellent uh, work of intellectual history won the Murrow Kennedy Award for Schleifer in 1981. After that, Professor Schleifer continued his study of Tocqueville, including translating the critical edition of Democracy in America. And, and in 2012, uh, Professor Schleifer published the Chicago Companion to Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which offered a comprehensive introduction to the theoretical structure of uh, democracy in America. So today, uh, as a le leading scholar in Tocqueville study, Professor Schleifer, uh, this time on the stakes, to offer a comprehensive introduction to Tocqueville's entire lives and, uh, life and the works. I mentioned the story of the materials at Yale because it's related to the char characteristic approach by the so-called Yale School of Tocqueville Study. They, uh, they actually combine studying uh, Tocqueville's unpublished text and studying his uh, unpu many unpublished manuscripts, uh, private letters, and working drafts. This approach helps make a full portrait of Tocqueville's life trajectory and uh, intellectual development. This approach is also commonly followed by later scholars uh, thanks to the Yale scholars' contribution and the, the later publication of Tocqueville's uh, complete works in France, which uh, Professor Schleif also participated. As we can see, this approach is uh, followed in this new book, and it should be appreciated. As, as, as Schleif points out, quote, the story of Tocqueville as the thinker is one of dynamic, ongoing change and development, and also, as we, we see, Tocqueville also has some continuing, consistent concerns in his theoretical thinking, but his, his thought indeed developed and changed. 
So in, instead of treating it as a static system, we can more faithfully uh, restore Tocqueville's thought by chasing his change of ideas, change of focuses uh, in different life stages, and compare, com by comparing which argument he decided to put in print and which not. So Tocqueville was, was, was not only a thinker, he was directly uh, engaged in French politics. So he aspired to be a real political man, man of action. So his thinking and writing were part of his political action aimed at the pro political uh, progress of his country. So because he was a public and political figure, he was, he was very cautious about how uh, his idea should be conveyed to the, to the audience and which idea would better be reserved to his own private uh, communication with his friends. So uh, Schleifer's approach is important for re revealing the multiple phases of Tocqueville's thought, with some of which Tocqueville actually refused to let others know at his time. So an, an example can, uh, which can show the value of this approach is related to what Professor Schleifer has discussed on Tocqueville's uh, as a social reformer. Uh, because he fo Tocqueville focused on the so-called e equality and uh, democracy in the, in the book, he was sometimes criticized for ignoring the serious problem of inequality, economic inequality in the modern age. But as uh, Schleifer points out, um, Tocqueville had clearly recognized the industrialization as an independent force from democracy in causing social economic inequality. So his focus on democracy and equality in his book was more of a choice uh, of arguing strategy rather than lack of knowledge. As Schleifer mentioned, Tocqueville knew and read many economists' works at his time. Uh, he read French economist Jean Baptiste Say uh, and the, the English political economist uh, Nassau Senior was his close friend and also a French politi political economist Arban de Villeneuve Bargemont, uh, who wrote and criticized the unrestrained capitalism at his time from a moralist uh, perspective, also deeply uh, influenced Tocqueville's views in Democracy in America. And I would add that when he prepared writing Democracy in America, uh, he also borrowed many U.S. government documents uh, uh, through his acquaintance in U.S. Edward Livingston, who was actually the a state secretary of the United States and then the ambassador to Paris. So by reading these materials, Tocqueville fully understood the investment and expansion of infrastructure and industry in the U.S., but he chose not to quite focus on this issue of industrial development in the book. Only after he published the first volume of Democracy in America and entered the political life during the July monarchy, Tocqueville, the politician, paid special attention to the problem of the poverty and the miseries of the working class is caused by industrialization. And he also proposed policies of uh, public charity and uh, some uh, remedies. So re resorting to, to this variety of resources, uh, Schleifer's book reveals the richness of Tocqueville's thought and lets us know his strategy in writing, both as a thinker, theorist, and uh, as a political man, a, polit a politician. So there are other, other important topics uh, in these books. So uh, before I end my discussion, I want to talk about the, the last, uh, interest, last interesting chapter in this book, which where Schleifer discussed Tocqueville's posthumous influence and global receptions. As you may know, Tocqueville is often quoted and mentioned by contemporary politicians. In the US, the list includes Ronald Reagan, uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, hopefully not uh, Trump. Oh. So, sometimes the quote was unfortunately uh, made up by speech writers, but that still shows Tocqueville's influence and popularity. Uh, Obama regards Professor Roger Broch, an important uh, Tocqueville scholar, as his favorite professor at Occidental College. More interestingly, and in two, 2012, the Communist Party leaders in China, including the Chinese uh, premier, and uh, Li Keqiang and the uh, current vice president, uh, Wang Qishan, also recommended the Chinese Communist Party members' cages to read Tocqueville's Old Regime and Revolution. As Schleifer mentions in this book, Tocqueville's uh, uh, Old Regime receives more attention in China than democracy in America. That is, be that is because 
many Chinese people think Ch the Chinese society may be facing a similar situation of the French order regime in the eve of the revolution. As Tocqueville states, the French Revolution did not break out during the high time of despotism, but at the time when the regime began to take in, began to take reforming steps, maybe some Chinese leaders wanted party members to be more alert to the potential crisis in the contemporary reforming era of Chinese society. So the the, the leaders' uh, recommendation started Tocqueville started a Tocqueville fever in China, and it was also, also at that time when I was at in the college, I began to read and be uh, fascinated by Tocqueville. So we live in an age of global democratization, or maybe currently a backsliding and or crisis of global democracy. So this situation makes Tocqueville's theoretical reflections on a modern democracy timely relevant, and I think we can learn many important lessons from his thinking. At last, I, I want to raise a few questions I, I have uh, regarding Tocqueville's theoretical relevance to the contemporary global democracy. Uh, as you may notice, Tocqueville, um, Tocqueville's theoretical elaboration of the modern equality of social condition is partly embedded in the background of Western culture of Christianity. He says that an equality of social condition is spreading among the Christian nations, maybe not all human society. That, that is because he believes Christianity has a clear theological and uh, moral presumption of human equality and human dignity, which does not necessarily, necessarily exist in other cultures and religions. He sometimes criticizes the moral implication of inequality in other religions. So how should we look at the moral and the religious foundation of Tocqueville's theory of democracy? Uh, I don't think his theory of democracy is entirely inferred from Christian doctrines, but Christianity and religion indeed plays an important role in his thinking. So as he famous states, in the historical development of human society, mores, morality, custom is more important than institutions, and institution is more important than natural conditions. So what is this theoretical statement's implication for contemporary uh, glo global democracy? Does it mean that the democratization is not merely a political and uh, institutional uh, agenda, but also could be a cultural, should be a cultural agenda? Does this imply Tocqueville's cultural chauvinism? Is, is it possible to fit his theoretical vision into the contemporary context of multi multiculturalism and uh, uh, value pluralism. So that's my, my question and title of him reading and understanding Tocqueville. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Since my colleague Jeff Isaac is not here, I can afford taking two questions at the time. <laughs> uh, so um, I would like to, uh, to ask that you please formulate your questions quickly and then would we'll, we'll allow the panelists to answer all of the questions. Thank you to uh, Christine and Juan Gu and of course Jim for your excellent comments. It's a pleasure to, to have such a variety of rich perspectives. So without further ado, if you'd like to identify yourselves, uh, it's fine. Uh, so it's time for questions and discussions. I can start with one just to, to, to start the conversation. Um, why is it that Tocqueville is, is, this is for the whole conversation, why is it Tocqueville is, is um, uh, so uh, appealing to people on, on the left, the center, and the, the right. Uh, what are the themes that he might uh, help us with, you know, bringing a, a kind of a center type of politics today? Kevin, you had the... Mm -hmm. So Tocqueville, of course, wrote about how he admired civil society in the United States, but in his own France, there was a uh, strong centralizing state uh, that suddenly had enduring doubts about the legitimacy of the new governments, which probably uh, many countries today have kind of similar concerns. Did he have any practical political proposals for strengthening political uh, civil society in France? Well, the I think the it, his fundamental response would be the encouragement of local level activity. Um, it was through the localities where people would be thrown together and be forced to deal with 
any kinds of social issues that emerged. Um, and I think from his perspective, it's, it's that local level participation which will engender other kinds of connections, other activities. Um, you know, he, he was, he was, it goes back to things that struck him in the United States when he was traveling. He was so struck by the fact that in the New England towns, if a problem came up, people got together to solve it on the local level because they were used to working together in, a, in the locality. Um, that was the building block. And so that developed a sense of shared interest, give and take, compromise, um, enlightened self-interest, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and so it, it, became, it became the, the seed ground for the kind of participation and civic engagement that he's always praising. So, I mean, that's, that's my first response. In, in, in France, he was arguing for greater independence on the loca in the localities and uh, greater independence on the provincial level as well. Um, because that's that's really the starting point. I don't know what else. Yeah. Also, like when um, in the second memoir, when he's talking about the savings banks, the savings yeah. associations, those are going to be kind of locally based. It's one of the ways since we talk about uh, economics to help alleviate poverty is this sort of scheme that he starts to propose where uh, workers would be encouraged to save some of their money, but it would be a kind of associative thing where people would also subscribe to invest their money in it. And then those funds that would be through this community kind of partnership would be available to people in times of need. So, so it's that kind of local engagement that he saw um, building connections between people. And here, actually, class connections between people yeah. and helping overcome one of those problems that he sees in modernity. Yeah, he mentioned at one point, I uh, give the example uh, in, his, in his notes for the Ancien Regime, he, he points to the example of the agricultural societies that still existed um, in some parts of France in the 1700s. And he uses them as an example. He said those were one of the few because the civil society had withered. Um, and he, 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 he points to those societies. He said that's one of the rare times when the classes got together in the locality in France to deal with agricultural problems, um, agricultural decisions that had to be made. So he uses it as, a, as an example. And that kind of agricultural society would be exactly the kind of element of civic uh, civil society that that he would like to see flourish. Just to piggyback yeah. on, on, on your points, in uh, the class that I'm teaching this semester, uh, Introduction to Political Theory, we are reading on Wednesday, actually, a chapter from your translation. It's, it's the chapter on the advantages of democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the point that you made, uh, you both made, is that what really matters is what we can do, what society can do without the help of government rather than with the help of government. And I, I, I wonder whether that, that that idea is still to be taken at face value, or it's a little bit um, perhaps pushed to extreme uh, in some respects, that we do need government. It's just that uh, some type of government impedes well, the society. Well, when you, when you think about, when you think about um, what I've called um, Tocqueville's political program, the kinds of things he wants to set up in a society in order to encourage um, real participation, real liberty. Um, when you think about that, and you think about some of the ways in which you wanted to tackle the problem of poverty or the problem of growing inequality, you think about those things, you're left with the question, who's doing that? Who is going to do that? Who's going to undertake setting up the institutions, fostering them, making sure they are healthy? Um, it doesn't just happen by itself. Um, and once you, I mean, I suppose you can use kind of jumping off, once you get things going, then it can more and more go by itself. But something has to happen. So, his, so he, in, in, as a political figure in France, he is expecting the government to do certain things, to tackle, he, you know, when I give examples, he wants hospitals for the poor, he wants free education, he wants help for single mothers, he wants to make sure that people have enough to eat. I mean, who's going to do that? In the locality, in, in Normandy, in the region, um, he proposed and had laws passed to provide that help, and he urged 
the same kind of thing to be done on the national level. So to accomplish what he wanted, at least in an initial stage, somebody has to t get the ball rolling. And so that, that's, that's why he says, you know, that in a democracy, in a democratic society, you, 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 you can't just, the government has to do things. It has to be active. And he says in, even the more democratic it is, the, because people tend to be weaker on them by themselves, you need to have more government initiative at least to get things going. And that's at least how he's thinking about France. How are you going to turn the ship around? Somebody's got to be up there. But it's a funny kind of midpoint, right? Yeah, As you yeah. said, to hit. I mean, there's somewhere in the yeah. somewhere in the notes he has that, that little note to self about the the first task of government is to help citizens yeah, totally. do without yeah, it, yeah, too, yeah, though. Exactly. I mean, so, yeah. so too little is not going to do it for him, and too much right. is going to is going to sort of be a crowding out problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's that the debate for Toko, the question for Toko is is where the the appropriate limits are. If government does nothing, then you can't solve anything. At least in the society like France in the eighteen forties and eighteen fifties, you can't you can't tackle the problems that are obvious. But on the other hand, if the government does everything, then the people are not going to be encouraged to do something. So, so it's it's really it's it's a question of of Tocqueville uses a lot of language about the, the various circles and limits and and the, how the things how things need to be within their own circle of responsibility. Uh, and I think I think that's the kind of image government has a certain circle, and you don't want them to get outside of that circle. But on the other hand, within that circle. It can't be an indolent government. So it, it's that kind of it's that kind of moderation again, trying to find the try to find the the, the right line, um, and and that's a huge challenge, obviously for it's a it, it's the it's an ongoing relevant challenge for every 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 government every society. For the sake of moderation, I'm going to give the floor yeah. to the right side of the room, Mike. <laughs> right side of the room. Ah, okay. Uh, I kind of like the question about the role of uh, uh, Christianity and, and the extent to which that limits or, or shapes Tocqueville's thought, and, and I'd just like to tie it to what you were just talking about, because one of the major differences in the religious environments in the United States and France at that time was that in, in the U.S., the most denominations were very much locally focused on congregations and not really centrally organized, maybe organized at the state level, but certainly not at the national level. So is that why religion was, he called, the first political um, uh, institution in the U.S.? Was its local basis, or was there something else about it? I, well, I, I think Tocqueville's argument is that religion is crucial for, for shaping mores, values, okay. and, and letting people know that they can't be so only self-interested or materialistic or that they need to be aware of other needs so and, and other kind of moral mm -hmm. issues but that that's that's the key thing the mores are the most important thing in the society and in the case of the United States to take that example uh, religion shaped the mores um, Tokyo is very specific however about why religion Continued to be so powerful in the United States, and he he argues it was because it was there was separation of church and state. There was no state religion. The problem in France, and he's very explicit about it in the old regime. The problem in France was that the church had gotten into bed right. with the government, right. and when the government fell, the church was attacked at the same time. So it's it was a package, and when the you know so everything exploded at the same time. Um, so I think I think that's. Um, that, that separation of church and state is a more specific reason why. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I also I, I, I wrote an article about Tocqueville and China and Japan, interest in the various readings of Tocqueville, um, and, um, and then out of those readings and the various, it, it raises certain kinds of questions. Um, and this goes a little bit to, to, to what you were saying. Um, that article is um, supposed to be part of a, it's a chapter in a book that's supposed to come out in a year or two. 
um, we'll see. But in any case, um, one of the things I do in that article is, is to move from Chinese and Japanese interest in Tocqueville to some questions. Um, and one of the questions that occurred to me as I thought about how, particularly in Japan, Tokyo has been read, and Tokyo has been read in Japan, interest in Tokyo in Japan has been since the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long time. Um, certain pieces of Tokyo. Um, and what, what occurred to me is, this goes back to your question on religion, I'm sort of going around the mm -hmm. bush here, but Tokyo's argument is that for a really healthy, prosperous democracy, you need to have decentralization, and you need to have uh, religion. But if you look at Japan, it's a society that by almost any standard is very democratic, very egalitarian in many respects, mm -hmm. but very secular and quite centralized. Right. So was Tokyo wrong? Can you in fact have a healthy democracy into the future? If you look at the Scandinavian countries, there's not much religion there, but there's certainly plenty of democracy and a lot of equality. So. Is the role of religion really what Tocqueville thought? I mean, it's, that's a, I think it's a legitimate question. But for him, religion was very important, obviously. And I think it comes out of his own, not that he was a believing Catholic, but he was profoundly shaped by moral sensibilities of his Catholic upbringing. Would you please ask the two questions that were you and then Jim and others can ask us, so we'll take two. Uh, yeah, so my, my question, I, uh, a lot of what I know from Tocco comes from Vincent Ostrom's book. From, I'm sorry? Vincent Ostrom's book, yeah. the Meaning of Democracy, Vulnerability of Democracies, which really like, takes up Tocco's challenge. And so I, my question kind of is on the idea of participation that you keep bringing up. Uh, if you could elaborate more on what that would mean, because from Ostrom's perspective, it seems like voting has little or nothing to do for it. Uh, you know, it's all about constitutional craftsmanship. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you could elaborate more on what Topo himself would have said about what does participation in this mean? Uh, and does this require a more polycentric form of governance uh, rather than government? Um, and I'm wondering if also if any kind of a side question on this, if, who, or if like more, uh, like uh, Topo would read or, read or thought of anything about like Gustav Molinari or like, Oh, I'm sorry. Gustav Molinari, uh, 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 he was a yeah. student of Bastiat or a friend of Bastiat. Yeah. Um, but kind of on that, the polycentric, is there a difference between government and governance? Well, I'm gonna go back, let me go to the... Can, can we see oh, the other question as well? And then, yeah. and then you can yeah. ask both. Yeah, it's, actually, it's a short question, but maybe a fun one of, what is it as scholars, whether historians or theorists, that you find most kind of aggravating that people misunderstand Tocqueville. When they, when they talk about Tocqueville, they make an argument, Tocqueville said this, but in oh. fact, he never did. I uh, wonder if there's any pet peeves you have, but great. OK, the floor is yeah, yours. I think Nick's, I think maybe yeah, Nick's uh, question first. Let, let, let me, uh, Nick's is about Ostrom, uh, Tony's. Yeah, yeah, well, I uh, want to go back to the uh, issue of um, participation. Um, I think, again, maybe the best way to get into it is to think about um, the localities um, and people getting together to discuss whatever issues need to be faced, talking together, meeting together, making decisions together, um, a kind of grassroots participation. I think this is what Tocqueville, the ideal thing he had in his mind. Um, because he's, he's, he argues that by talking together, people realize that there are different viewpoints, different interests, and you begin to realize the broader public interest, not just your own. And so um, it's, it's a kind of grassroots participation, which can be, it can be institutionalized, it can be part of governments, that is localities, town government, for example, in the heyday, if it ever existed as he describes it, but uh, that kind of thing. Uh, or it could be just a grassroots um, um, civic society, the civil society, the kind of, um, you know, interest groups get together and they, they 
they publish a newsletter, they meet together, they elect officers, they go out and lobby or in, try to influence. Um, it, it's that kind of that, that kind of participation is is what he's talking about. So it's it's um, it's it's related to you know the right the right to vote, the right to speak, the right to assemble, the right to publish, the right to express yourself, to um, get out there and do things. Uh, that, that's the participation. I think he has in mind. So I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but that's that's what I think he was envisioning. In terms of what is it that you would what, what would, do people what would, yeah ascribe to? I the guess real false I guess I maybe because I just finished this this um, Tokyo book. One of the things that irritates me most is when people quote Tocqueville to prove that government is the problem and not the solution. When they push that to the point where, get the government off my back, just leave me alone, Tocqueville would argue for that. No, Tocqueville doesn't argue for that. Tocqueville argues for restraint, for moderation, for morality, he argues for a lot of things, and he argues for, for um, a certain kind of public action. He, he was, he, he was aware that you can have oppression from private sources. Mm. And so who is to protect you from that? Private sources can be tyranny of the majority, clothed in a democratic guise. It can be the local industrialist who mm. works you over. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, so I th Tokyo is, is much more complex than just being anti-government. And that, I guess that's one of the things that that um, Did you want to I, would, I would like to add that Tocqueville emphasized like the channeling between civil association and the political association. I think the, the energy of the civil society and the, the uh, active participation, democratic participation in government cannot be cannot be separated, and they should be uh, combined and complementary to each other. So that's that's when when when, when we talk about Tocqueville's idea of. Uh, cautions against centralization, centralization, but that's not to say that uh, Tocqueville is generally against the governmental activities. He, he wants the energy of democratic society both in the civil sphere and in the political sphere. Yeah, that's that's a very good, very good point. It reminds me of that Tocqueville talks a lot about the interplay between uh, civil society and political society, and how political institutions. Healthy political institutions can stimulate civic activity, civil activity, and, and and obviously the other way around. And there are chapters where he actually talks about how those two things are related. And I think here it's an excellent point that they they energize each other. Um, and uh, yeah, and each assume a kind of individual activism within them, right? Yeah, so yeah. so sort of I mean you know Tocqueville's writing at a time where he says, "Golly, there's just not much national government going on here." Mm -hmm. We hardly even know it exists. So that when he talks about government, he's talking about something that is much more immediate yeah. to the people who are involved with and affected by it than almost every form of government we experience today. So it's it's hard to read. I mean, they just don't map onto each other as neatly as people want them to for a variety of reasons. Right. The other um, thing that bothers me, I suddenly popped into my <laughs> Oh, yeah, that yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that bothers me is that people talk about tyranny of the majority, as Tocqueville describes it in Democracy in America, and um, they forget that what he says very explicitly is I'm not talking about tyranny of the majority on the national level, I'm talking about tyranny of the majority on the state level. It's in the states where the danger of tyranny of the majority exists in the United States. So that, and people just pay no attention to that much. It's an appealing subject. Yeah. Um, Steve and then Guillaume. So. Yeah, just uh, that was Madison's point, the point you just made. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. real danger of Tyrion, the majority, yes. is at the state level, not at the national level. But I, um, your first comment uh, about uh, the important, the government has to, has to, somebody's got to get things started. So it reminded me of the quotation when it comes to social reform in France, you look to the government, in England to a great lord in America to voluntary associations. So my first question was going to be, so how exportable is the American experience?
Americans, right? I mean, uh, but then <clears throat> you went back to that just recently. So would Tocqueville, do you think Tocqueville would say, well, this, this voluntary association phase is just a passing phase as America grows, as it matures, it too will become like uh, most European government, the center of fo locus will move from voluntary association to governments, or how would, how would Tocqueville see exporting the American experience elsewhere? For well, I, I, don't, I don't think that he would assume that voluntary associations um, are, are going to be Are going to be passed by in the United States. I don't think he was. What he what he was, what he was hoping is that you could encourage that kind of associational activity in localities in France, mm -hmm. and and you know we often Americans don't think about it or aren't aware of it. In fact, in France there are that that has happened in the last 150 200 years. There are lots more associations local level. Um, Activities of all sorts, regional activities of all sorts. So, so in one sense, Tocqueville's hopes for France, in fact, are they're taking shape. There, that's actually occurring. Um, in terms of whether the American experience or example can be exported, that raises a whole other question. Because what what I what I heard in both China and Japan when I have been there talking with faculty and with students is a quite striking conclusion that the American model is no more. Um, that for the future, um, there are other models that have to be sought. And what those models are, no one is sure about and nobody has concluded. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, we were talking the last night, whether it's Singapore or, or what, I mean, who knows what the model is. Um, but it's, well, not, at least in China and Japan, that was a, a very important topic that was discussed by the students. They were fascinated by the fact that Tocqueville came here in the United States at a time when he was arguing that what was happening in the U.S. was what was happening everywhere else in the future. We were the model in that sense. It was <coughs> happening here first. Um, and now the feeling is, you know, history's passed us by. Um, we are, no. Uh, and, and so there's a, at least among the people I was talking to, is a search for a different model, but nobody knows what that model is. So um, that, that's a different, different. Maybe Guillaume knows what the model is. <laughs> No, I'm not sure. But um, in the uh, introduction to democracy in America, uh, uh, Tocqueville describes uh, democracy as a providential fact. And um, what is your opinion as to what he means by that, by providential fact? Um, I, I think he means exactly what he says. He, he thinks Literally. it was set in motion by God. It's um, <laughs> it's something that, and and he, I think he, I think he did feel that. I think he did believe that. Um, but I also think that it was, it goes back to his effort to convince his audience. He was trying to convince devout Catholics, devout Christians, mostly Catholic obviously in France, not to totally reject the growing equality and growing democracy that, that was happening not to retreat from that, um, but to deal with it, and to deal with it um, in productive ways, in ways that would bring forth the advantages and avoid the disadvantages of advancing democracy. So the best way to appeal to devout Catholics who were anti-democratic was to say, well, you know, democracy is really God-given. You need to go in the direction of where God wants the society to go. So I think, I think there was an audience targeted audience that, that's involved here. Uh, he, and he, he, repeats that, he repeats that kind of language in a few other places as well. Uh, it's not just in the introduction, but, but I, I think because of his own, I think because of his own upbringing, 
Um, and I, I think he, he probably deep down did believe that it was providential. But, I mean, who can prove that? But <laughs> Our time it will soon be up. I just want to conclude with a few thoughts about Tocqueville's uh, complexity. In a letter to his English translator, he read this, he wrote this, I please many people of conflicting opinions, not because they understand me, but because they find in my work, by considering it only from one single side, arguments favorable to their passion at the moment. But I have confidence in the future, and I hope that the day will come when everyone will see clearly what only some perceive today. And I think it's safe to say that uh, because of the efforts, half a century long efforts of Jim Schleifer and other valiant Tocqueville scholars. Now we have a clearer, a clearer view of Tocqueville's unity, the unity of Tocqueville's thought, which has always been uh, difficult to perceive. Tocqueville remains an elusive thinker in many ways. Tocqueville, the man, continues to fascinate as much as Tocqueville, the private man, as much as Tocqueville, the, the politician. Um, as Jim pointed out at the beginning, and we'll be exploring this in the, in the introduction to political theory class, Democracy in America, democracy in democracy in America has 19 meanings, perhaps more, perhaps less, but certainly there is not one single meaning. Today, in courses in political science, we want a dependent variable. Tocqueville had too many dependent <laughs> variables. Tocqueville worked, Tocqueville probably, if he submitted his dissertation here or elsewhere as a PhD student, he would have not passed the comprehensive exams because he didn't have one and I think it's because he worked with so many notions of democracy that he was able to perceive the multiple facets of democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's why we read him today more so than other thinkers who we are fascinated. Where the future will take, I think, this panel, as well as Jim's works and, and anyone else's contributions, uh, will, 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 uh, will not be able to, to tell us. I think that, as you pointed out in response to Steve's question, it's important to to keep in mind that Tocqueville wrote for a French audience and he wanted to convince his 19th century readers that they were not doomed, but they could work with democracy if they knew how to do it. If I had to make one single criticism of the translation that the book has mistranslated the very title of the book. The, very, the title of the book is De la Democratie en Amérique. It's on democracy in America. In a way, by translating it as democracy in America, we, we kind of lose sight of the fact that Tocqueville was an anthropologist, an analyst of democracy. America was his case studies. So I hope that one day, one of you, maybe one of us, will be able to write another book with a similar title on democracy, I don't know where, in the 21st century. So this concludes our session today. No, I, I, no, I have yes. one. <laughs> oh, come on, give me a chance. <laughs> I have to respond. He will have it. Uh, Jim I, has a chance I, I, I to, have to respond to that. In the uh, translator's introduction to the critical edition, um, I deal with some of the particular words that were troublesome and so on, and also some of the principles of, of the translation. And one of the stated principles was that whenever in the chapters, Tocqueville says de whatever it happens to be, we say of. You notice in the chapter headings it's always of whatever of. And, and, um, but we all agreed on the committee that because of the unshakable fame of democracy in America as a title, you couldn't play with that because the temptation would ex do exactly what Aurelian said. We, we could have renamed it of or on democracy in America, but that was just beyond the, <laughs> I mean, that we just couldn't do it. So, so we didn't do it. But, but Aurelian's point is, is, is a very good point. I mean, ideally, it should have a different title. We will accept Jim's generous <laughs> <laughs> and we'll give the whole panel a, a, a round of applause.